Well, good evening and welcome. This is the virtual community meeting for the Grindstone Fire Complex, which includes the Sourtown Mountain Fire in Stokes County. My name is Jason Guidry. I am a liaison officer with the North Carolina Forest Service Red Incident Management Team. The North Carolina Forest Service is a division of the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Tonight, you're gonna to hear from our incident team members, our incident commanders, our operations, um, personnel, and our public information about updates on this fire. Because of the virtual format, we're gonna to have to do a question and answer section at the end, and you're gonna to need to utilize the chat function in your Zoom application. We'll take those questions and other, member, other team members will be answering those as best we can. Don't think we're gonna approach our 350 participant limit tonight. We'll let you know that this video will be recorded and uploaded to the North Carolina Forest Services YouTube channel later this evening. So if you need to share that link with other people who couldn't make it tonight, that's where you can find some of this good information. So I wanted to introduce you to our Deputy Incident Commander, Shane Hardy. Shane. Hey, good evening. Shane Hardy with the North Carolina Forest Service Red Incident Management Team. So the first thing I'll get into tonight is what is an incident management team? What do we do and why are we here? And so a fire like this fire uh, up on Pilot Mountain requires a, a significant number of assets. Uh, to control the fire, and with that come complexities. So those firefighters on the ground have to be supported, and so it requires logistical support in the form of meals, uh, hotels, a place to lodge, medical, uh, as repairs to vehicles. Those, those logistical functions have to be fulfilled so that the firefighters can concentrate on the task at hand, which is to fight the fire. Uh, additionally, we have to deal with media interest. Uh, so we have a PIO section that comes with us to address those and, and deal with those PIO concerns. So it does not distract the firefighters on the ground from their job. And we have liaison officers that work with uh, our cooperators, our emergency management coordinators, our fire departments, things like that to keep them informed and address their concerns uh, about the fire. Uh, we also ha have to financially support uh, the operation. Uh, bills are generated, and so we have a, a whole section of ladies that, that keep up with that cost. They pay the bills, and they acquire the things that uh, purchase, things that are needed for the fire to be successful. Uh, the operations section comes in with a, a lot of very experienced uh, firefighters that uh, have great knowledge and experience to bring to the table to work through some of the complexities that the firefighters will uh, face on the ground and to see those out in advance and make sure that we have the operational assets in place ahead of time uh, so that firefighting operations can continue successfully uh, and resolve the situation as efficiently as possible. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what an incident management team does. Uh, we also, I should mention, and I left out, we, we have a, a very good planning section that provides us with some of the, the latest state-of-the-art uh, applications that technology has to offer, looking at fire science, uh, what smoke is gonna do, what the fire is gonna do. Uh, also provides mapping products and, and gives us a, a lot of documents daily, both to our team, to firefighters on the ground, uh, to answer questions that they're gonna need answers to so they don't have to look for that information, uh, as well as, we send information about the fire uh, to other agencies through our uh, planning section, including uh, the federal uh, firefighting agencies to keep them informed of the status of our incident. Uh, with that, I'm gonna move on to a few uh, points of, that I want to talk to you about tonight. The first one is gonna be donations. So I want to, to really stress how grateful uh, we are as an incident management team and the locals uh, here uh, in District 10 of the North Carolina Forest Service are for the amount of donations, the pouring of love that has been demonstrated by this community 
uh, with what they've tried to do to help us, what they've tried to do to help the local fire department resources as well. Uh, water and food has been donated in tremendous supply. And I want to relay the message at this time, we have all of the food and water that we can use. Um, what you've done is, is, I can't overstate the appreciation for that, but it's becoming a, an incident within an incident is what we call it at this point, where we no longer have a place to store additional food and water supplies that people are donating. And so I would ask you, uh, if you wanna help, there are ways you can help. And so that would be to make a monetary donation to your local fire department or your local uh, rescue squad, any type of emergency response agency within your community uh, would be the place to, to send those donations. Um, but please, we ask that the food and water, uh, it's, it's helped and we appreciate it, but we, we really can't take on any more of that at this time. The other issue that I want to bring tonight is, uh, as you are aware, a burn ban was issued at five o'clock p.m. yesterday afternoon, and that was statewide. Uh, although I'm sure many of you may have questions that you would like answers to regarding the burn ban, the laws that surround the burn ban and the complexities of that, uh, this meeting, we really want to maintain a focus on the fires that we're here to discuss, Grindstone and Sour Mountain. And so if you have questions about a burn ban, I'd encourage you to contact your local county ranger's office or your local uh, forest service district office to, to discuss those concerns or questions with your, your local ranger. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our information officer, Mr. Bill Swartley. Thank you, Shane. I'm Bill Swartley, North Carolina Forest Service, Red Team, IMT. Uh, a history, North Carolina Forest Service, IMT manages both the Grindstone Fire and the Sour Town Mountain Fire. The Sour Town Mountain Fire started November 9th. The Grindstone Fire started November 27th. Now, the current information as of this afternoon. The Grindstone Fire footprint is 1,050 acres and 20% contained. 15 NC State Parks and 27 NC Forest Service firefighting personnel are working on the Grindstone Fire. The Sour Town Mountain Fire remains at 40 acres and is 100% contained. The ICP or Incident Command Post is located at 615 East Highway 52 Bypass in Pilot Mountain. That's an overview. Now I'll give it to Derek Moore, Ops Chief. Okay, I am unmuted. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, good evening. My name is Derek Moore, I'm Operations Section Chief for the North Carolina Forest Service Red Incident Management Team. Um, I'm going to try to, within a few minutes here, kind of walk you through uh, where we're at. On the, uh, on the grindstone complex, grindstone and sour town mountain fire. Um, what I'm gonna try to do is basically explain where we're at at the moment, how we got there and where we're gonna go from here. I'm gonna try to answer those three things. To be able to do that better, um, we've got these maps up on the wall, but I think I can better serve you 
if I can um, share my screen, share the uh, aerial photographs on my screen here. So give me just a second here. And we're gonna do just that. And it may take a second to come through on your end. But folks, what you should be seeing right now is an aerial photograph of the uh, Pilot Mountain State Park area. If you see the uh, yellow diagonal line going through the middle, that's Highway 52. Uh, north is up, just like any other map that you'd have on your phone or, or, or paper map or so on. Um, if you can kind of, you know, we're looking straight down. This is as the crow flies. This is as a satellite looking down on Earth. If you look at the, um, the red blob in the center of your screen, that is our fire footprint. The, uh, the greener shades around that is basically your park boundary. Uh, we're going to zoom in a little bit and get some more detail there. Um, matter of fact, let's do just that. And I understand there's probably a few seconds lag time on your end, so I'm gonna to try to kind of take this slow and easy. As a matter of fact, I think I can kind of change my image here to give you something you might be a little bit more accustomed to looking out across the horizon. And I'll give that just a second to kind of, to kind of upload on your end. Um, so like I said, the, uh, the red shading in the middle, that is the fire area, the bright red line around that, that's our fire perimeter. Now, there's some other little things on your screen there that may look like little butterflies, little brackets. That's just some little geographical boundaries that we have on our end. Uh, it's basically how we, uh, when we, when we attack a, a large fire, we basically break it up into pie pieces, you know, one bite at a time. And uh, we assign supervision to each one of those pie pieces. And that's just one of our, our methods of dealing with a large fire. So back to the fire perimeter and the fire area. Um, go ahead and explain this up front. Where you see the current fire perimeter is where we fully expect the fire to remain. In other words, where the fire perimeter is at this moment is back down to our solid containment lines, combination of dozer lines, a little bit of hand line, the uh, park infrastructure roads, the fire has met our geographical boundaries for containment. Um, like I said, that's where we expect the fire to stay. If you may have noticed yesterday, uh, quite a bit of volume of smoke up in the air, not so much today. Reason for it, the fire is back down to our areas. So let's talk a little bit more about how we got there. Um, so, you know, there's 101 different ways that you can, you can attack a wildfire. And, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen it on TV all summer long, California, Montana, all those Western states. Uh, we have those news images ingrained in our brains and, you know, some really, uh, some really intense stuff. And in our agency, our IMT, we're involved in all those things too. Um, there's a tremendous direct approach taken on a lot of those large Western wildfires. Now, every once in a while, you get a case just like this one here, where you could take a large approach. We could pound it with large aerial tankers. We could cover the mountain with uh, dozers, uh, cutting lines, so on, take an extremely aggressive approach. In this particular case here, the reality is that's not the best approach for the land. And we believe that's not the best approach for you guys either. So basically our strategy here is we've taken a wildfire and turned it into a prescribed burn. And so to explain that a little bit further, um, rather than scarring up the mountainside, rather than washing out uh, some of these drainages and so on, rather than putting uh, large amounts of air retardant on the mountain, the fire that was currently there, you know, when it, when it first started, yeah, it kind of made a run up to the top. And, you know, that was pretty intense. Once it got to the top, it's really kind of a backing game downhill. And, and to describe that best, imagine this. So you see the, uh, the image of, of Pilot Mountain in front of you. Imagine if we took a large scoop of ice cream and placed it right on top of the mountain. And imagine that scoop of ice cream kind of melting and slowly running down the top of the mountain. That's probably the best way that I can describe the fire progression. Just as you would imagine an ice cream cone dripping, 
that's the way our fire progressed. That type of fire is not that bad on the landscape. And I actually have to give props to our uh, state park folks. The, uh, the effort, the uh, prescribed burns, the fuels treatments, the contingency lines that they have put in over the years has allowed us an opportunity to let this fire burn light on the landscape. So as we meet our containment lines, you know, you probably heard some words like uh, burnout and, and, and backfiring and, and so on. And, you know, to contain, to, 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 to get the fire to our uh, containment lines and so on. And those words really don't describe it well. That's kind of a bad way to describe it on our end. Um, the burning that we did along our primary lines, it's really more, we call it strategic, strategic firing or strategic firing operations. So, you know, at no time did we really, you know, light several hundred acres on fire and let the fire run up the hill and so on. Imagine that ice cream cone again, as those drips, those runs came down to our dozer line, our, our hand line, our roads, we were basically able to kind of capture those drips, with a little bit of strategic firing on the ground, just putting a little bit of black on those lines basically where those drips were coming down at, and then kind of staying just ahead of it and allowing those fires to meet. So again, there's not tremendous fire intensity next to our lines or intensity going up the hill. Uh, too much fire intensity, we kill a lot of trees and those trees become snags and then they fall on the ground and that's just not good for the, uh, not good for the landscape, not good for the park and uh, not good for the firefighters either. So by taking this approach, we've actually been able to minimize the risk to firefighters greatly. We've been able to minimize the, uh, the risk to the landscape or the impact to the landscape quite a bit. Uh, in turn, um, intention was to minimize the impact to, to you guys, the private citizens, the private land holdings, um, and basically create something, like I said, what you would expect to see, a uh, prescribed fire um, from the North Carolina Park Service. So to go into a little bit more detail on the grindstone fire, um, let's talk about where we're going in the future. And I'm gonna spin this map a little bit and uh, bear with me, but we're gonna kind of spin it around and look at it from the highway. And I realize that, you know, there's a few seconds or maybe a little jumpy on your end. So I'm gonna give you just a couple of seconds there. But we're going to look at it from Highway 52. We're going to look at it from the Park Service office, the headquarters, the visitor center, looking straight up to the uh, Pilot Mountain knob up there. Um, so basically, on the on the north side, on the northeast side, the side adjacent to Highway 52, the right side of the fire perimeter image that you're seeing right now, we got a combination of the uh, the Park Service roads which make a great fire break. Um, just off the end of that, um, a, a dirt road that ultimately goes to and ties into some dozer line. Uh, if you see on the map there, there's a little green dot next to the highway that marks the Pilot Mountain Visitor Center. From there, headed to the south and headed around to, towards the bottom of the fire, we, uh, we pick up that dozer line. And like I said, that fire is back down. We've got solid black. We've consumed all the fuels all the way up to those primary lines. And now let me spin it again. We're gonna look at it from the south. Again, and maybe even take a little bit closer look in the, uh, the Almond Trail Road and uh, the uh, Johnny Ayers Road. Uh, you may be able to see those on your screen. If you live in that area, then you obviously know where I'm talking about. Uh, we can even, maybe if we're zooming in on your house right now, just stick your hand out the window, wave to us. We'd love to see you. Fire is a pretty good ways. Well, I say pretty good ways. Fire is a ways up the hill from where you're at. We've got that solid dozer line going all the way around the south end. We've got crews actively engaged on that dozer line. From here, we're going to continue to mop it up. We've got a lot of uh, fire hose on the ground where we're utilizing our, uh, our pumps and our engines and drop tanks and so on. And so we're able to actually get a little bit of water spread up and down the line there as we need to. 
And, and again, the uh, uh, snags, when we're talking about a snag, we're talk basically talking about a dead tree sticking up in the air. That's may have been probably dead for a while. Um, rotten snag, it may be burning. We're putting that kind of stuff on the ground, making sure we're not getting any kind of embers across the line. Um, we're in pretty darn good shape across the south end of the line. We're gonna continue to work those crews next couple of days at least. Um, we've got, we've made a lot of ground on this thing, cooling it off, but we're not gonna let up. We're gonna do our due diligence and we're going to continue that effort. We back out a little bit. And let's kind of look at this thing from the uh, from the west side. Looking back towards the highway. If you're familiar with uh, Pinnacle View Baptist Church, um, we're kind of looking from the parking lot there, looking up the hill. They kind of let's adjust it a little bit here. So again, around our west side, we've got that dozer line, and that's a solid containment line. We've got black established. When I say black, I'm talking about burned area established along that dozer line. Those fuels are consumed. Uh, still a little bit of smokes, whether it's stumps or logs or, or, or limbs or whatever, still smoldering. That's the stuff that we're mopping up. We're taking care of any snags or anything that may fall across the line or roll across the line and so on. And then just to get a good view, and bear with me now. I'm not a uh, I'm not a pilot by any means. Give it just a second or two to catch up on your computer. But now we're looking at the grindstone fire from the north, looking to the south. Uh, this is where our dozer line comes around the uh, the right side of your fire perimeter. There catches up with the dirt road trail, ties back into our uh, our park road. Our, uh, our asphalt road there, good containment there. Cooled down a lot today. We expect more of that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, we're gonna continue the effort. We're gonna maintain the presence there. We're gonna do our due diligence and um, we're gonna make absolutely sure, do our absolute best to keep this fire in this exact perimeter where you see it now. We're feeling pretty good about it. We're not gonna get overconfident. We're not gonna, you know, meh. Knock on wood, not gonna jinx ourselves, you know, but we feel pretty confident that this fire is gonna remain in this footprint right here. And we're gonna stick with you the next several days to, uh, to ensure that. Now, after the next several days, you know, we, uh, we may be looking at, uh, we, gotta, um, we gotta look at a few things, fire activity around us, our crews that are working here, maybe some higher priorities across the state, um, homes being directly threatened and so on. And so we've got to evaluate those things. And there's a lot of people in a lot of high places having those discussions right now. But even after this incident management team leaves the grindstone fire, even after our crews pull out of here, we will still maintain a presence. We will still mop up, maintain and monitor the fire um, with the local units, with the local district, with the local region, and included in that maintaining, uh, one thing I didn't mention before, you know, a lot of this fire, the, the fuels, it's driven by the leaf fall. And that's the reason for the fires that we're having this time of year, coupled with the drought. Um, we got to maintain the, that dozer line and keep the, uh, keep the leaves cleaned out of it. And we're going to do just that uh, in the coming days, but also in the coming weeks. This fire is going to be pretty high up on our radar until we get significant rain. And that's the honest truth. We've got several tools in our toolbox that we can monitor it. Uh, obviously with aviation, our scout planes, uh, helicopters, we can fly it every day. Uh, we have drone capability with some pretty fancy infrared cameras where we can really get in there and, and see the heat, um, see where the concerns are and get ahead of any potential issue. So that's the status of the grindstone fire and that's where we're headed in the future probably generate a lot of questions. We're gonna have a few minutes for that when I get done here, um, but I don't wanna ramble on too long. So I'm gonna adjust my map here just a second. And I do want to mention the Sourtown fire. And just for some orientation, I'm gonna give a second or two here to make sure your screen catches up. So you see the Grindstone Fire Pilot Mountain State Park 
uh, to the left side of your screen. And over on the right side of your screen, you see a much smaller 40 acre fire perimeter. Um, so let's zoom in on that a little bit. That is our Sourtown Mountain Fire. Um, and we can look at that in much of the same way. I'm gonna adjust my map here and give your screen a second or two to catch up. So the Sourtown Mountain Fire, uh, my understanding roughly the bulk of it was November 21st to 23rd, um, 40 acres, not a huge fire. But if you look at the if you look at the dark green shading on your photograph there on your screen, you know that's the timber, that's the land in front of it. Obviously, the uh, the private homes around it, the uh, the infrastructure and so on. Uh, this fire was 100% on private land. It's my understanding, I believe, majority of that ridge there is private land. And uh, so we uh, we had a similar incident management organization on that fire a couple of weeks ago. And they did a great job. They did their job and they did their due diligence. And then we continued into a drought. And what we've noticed in the past few days is that we've had a few items still smoking over within the perimeter of the uh, Sourtown Mountain Fire. Now, Sourtown Mountain Fire occurred before the majority of the leaves hit the ground. Now those leaves are on the ground. So we've got that potential for anything left burning, a stump hole or whatever, to ignite the new leaves on the ground, push towards our fire perimeter. So guess what? We need to staff and monitor the uh, Sourtown Mountain fire um, continuously, right on until similar situation, till we get significant rain, um, like we would hope for on the grindstone fire. And so what that includes is uh, boots on the ground, um, excuse me, checking it throughout the day, we, uh, we did fly the fire several times today. We also flew it with our IR camera, our infrared cameras, detected no significant heat in the Sourtown Mountain Fire today. Um, hopefully that'll be the case tomorrow. We feel good about this fire, but because of the potential that it may have, we are not gonna take our eyes off of this fire. There'll be a presence on the ground and in the, and in the air uh, for the coming days until we get significant rain. Now. Beyond that, because of the significant acreage up in front of this fire, there has already been a lot of contingency planning, uh, some dozer lines that's been put out ahead of the fire, uh, some contingency lines that have been mapped out. So if this fire did leave the current feet print, footprint, then uh, we do have right many options there that we can work with. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna do our best to make sure it does not leave that footprint. So that's where we're at. That's how we got there. That's where we're going from here. Um, so I want to wrap it up. I um, know we'll be able to have a few questions here in just a minute, um, but I'm going to go ahead and step to the side. And I believe our incident commanders are going to take back over. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and mute also. Thank you for that, Derek. So good evening, folks. Uh, I'm Greg Smith. I'm the Red Team Incident Commander with the North Carolina Forest Service. First of all, I just want to say thanks to my team. I want to say thanks to the that have been working these two fires over the duration of these two incidents since their ignition. Uh, these folks have done a, a marvelous job out there. They've put a lot of time and effort into what they've done. Uh, to protect the values at risk and to, and to protect the public. So kudos to those. I also want to give a shout out to my on this off tonight for you folks because it takes quite an effort to put together something like this in the short duration our team's been on assignment here uh part of that being with the technology that we uh they were challenged with uh these guys have really stepped up and wanted to provide you a good product for tonight so i, I really hope that uh you're getting what you would like to have tonight and uh, i want to say thanks to those folks um as you can see it takes quite a cooperative effort to pull off uh or to be this successful in a complex incident environment um and we really can't do that without, you know, a tremendous amount of support, uh, cooperation, and, and, and just our partnerships that are out there. And uh, there's a lot of folks that have been partnered up in this to help protect you and your values. And, you know, I'm just going to shout out a few, few, give a little shout out to a few folks for you on that. And that includes your local responders. You know, that includes the fire departments, it includes the EMS folks uh, that are out there daily protecting you and your values. 
Um, it also includes North Carolina State Parks. Uh, North Carolina State Parks has been a big partner in this. Obviously, a lot of the fire that's burning is on their ground. Um, we've had tremendous support from North Carolina Mercy Management, uh, also from Surrey County Mercy Management, Stokes County Mercy Management, and the Sheriff's Department uh, from both counties. Uh, North Carolina DOT has been participating in assistance also, you know, helping us give some warnings out there for smoke on the highway. 52 corridor. So as you can see, there's a lot of support uh, that goes into making us successful in a situation like this. Uh, the locals really set us up for success. Your local district, uh, your local county rangers uh, that work in this area, as well as state parks have put a tremendous amount of work into this and really made us uh, who we are as a team to come in and jump in and be successful. So those, those folks need a shout out. Uh, last thing I want to mention is, uh, you know, the other big partner in this, and we can't do without it, is our citizens. And that's people that are out there that, uh, that have the property, the landowners, the private citizens. And, you know, you're really the reason why we do what we do. And uh, you're the reason why that we're successful. So, you know, it's a big part of why everybody that is with the North Carolina Forest Service or on my team comes out and do what they do, and that's to support you. So there's been a tremendous amount of support. The donations been a tremendous amount of support uh, from, from all the locals that are, that are here and impacted by the fire, and we want to thank you for that. Um, I do want to kind of wrap up a little bit with where we go from here. Um, we're not done. We, there's still a lot of work to be done here on this incident. You know, we've got a uh, fire line out there that we've put in, uh, lines that we've cleaned out. We've got some rehab work to do on those. Um, we also have some still, we still have mop up. We still have hot spots. Uh, I know a lot of folks today noticed the reduction in smoke, but there's still smoke out there. So we've still got quite a bit of work to do there. Um, we're going to continue to stay active on that. Uh, you will see our, uh, for several more days, uh, and they're going to continue to do that mop up and we will continue to do our rehab on the fire lines we've established and try to take care of any suppression repair that's out there. Um, our team's going to be here. We'll be working next through the demo process. We'll be demobilizing resources. Uh, we'll do that in a manner that's effective, but also in a manner that we determine where's the greatest need. And if it's still here, then they will remain on scene. Um, I want to address a little bit too, as an incident commander, we, uh, today I was approached by an individual and asked me about our tactics a little bit. And I just want to kind of, uh, highlight a little bit of that conversation for you. Um, today I was asked why we did what we did or why do firefighters do certain tactics in certain locations? And, you know, it's all, anytime you make an operational action, operational decision, it's really based on your probability of success. And it's also based on the exposures to your firefighters. Um, you have to really consider your, your hazards and your associated risks out there. And then you got to consider, do you have a safe anchor point? Do you have the capability with the resources you have on scene to be successful? And, you know, quite honestly, that team has set us up for success. Some very good operational decisions were made early on in the early on in this fire. And especially when you consider the terrain topography and the hazards that exist up up on the mountain that we've been challenged with. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. A lot of folks had had some questions. Uh, there's very few anchor points up on the side of that mountain. And really, you have to work with that to establish a safe area to be, be installing fire line and continue your suppression action. Other thing I want to do is just say, you know, give a shout out when you get a chance, give a shout out to your local rangers, to your local fire department personnel, to your local EMS units. Uh, like I said, I think that's a big part of this community. Uh, they've definitely shown that in, in the partnership and cooperation. And I ask you to do that. Uh, we couldn't be successful as a North Carolina Forest Service or an incident management team without our support from our elected officials. You know, we have a tremendous amount of support there. So um, just want to kind of close with that. And then what I'd like to do is uh, we're going to kind of work our way into the question and answer section now. Uh, Derek's going to step back up as the operations section chief, and we're going to be available to answer some questions. I will tell you, folks, we're not going to be able to get to probably every question that's in the chat tonight. Uh, we do still have duties that are calling. Uh, we've got the fire that's still out there. I've got resources tonight that are working the fire. And so our plan is to answer a few questions tonight. We will record this video as mentioned, or it is being recorded. We'll get that posted for you. It'll probably be available either late tonight or tomorrow. So with that said, I'd like to go ahead and uh, turn it over. I think we're going to have some guys give us some uh, questions here. Okay, we've gotten several questions about the impacts to wildlife uh, in regards to both fires. Can you address what maybe you've seen or what we could expect on those impacts? 
and I'll start out. If Derek's got anything to add, I'll be glad to ask. Um, you know, fire and sometimes wildfire has different impacts on the wildlife and, and really basically their environment. Um, fire on the landscape is not always bad for wildlife. Uh, create some forage, create some habitat where some areas have been undergrown by brush in the past. Uh, I was on the fire today, uh, took a good trip around, uh, made it to the top of the mountain, also made my way around part of the fire lines. I didn't see any uh, devastation of wildlife that uh, most of the time they're able to flee and get out of the way. This fire did have some uphill runs that moved swiftly, but for the most part, um, didn't see any significant impacts to wildlife or, or, the, or the creatures or any, any other inhabitants out there. Um, it actually probably in places is going to create some better wildlife habitat. There's going to be some young successional growth that's going to come up in places. It also probably eliminated some of the shrub layer that's going to allow sunlight to reach the forest floor and provide a little better habitat for the wildlife. So, Derek, you got anything you want to add? Yeah, and that does go back to our tactics and what we described earlier, you know, uh, utilizing the best tactics, the best fire suppression for the landscape. And, you know, one of our large reasons for prescribed fire is wildlife management. So that in turn was a factor in how we manage this fire. Okay, Jason. Yeah, and there's been a couple of more questions about the air operations or air support. Um, can you guys maybe reiterate the timing of that and, and the need for that as this has progressed? Okay, well, Early on, the, uh, the first day of the fire, uh, aviation was very much involved. Our air support, our, our helicopters uh, understand the, uh, um, the, the bombers, the um, single engine air tankers that we have. Um, we're very much involved trying to catch this fire, trying to keep it small. Once it kind of exceeded that capability, you know, we're, we're, we're at a tipping point. All right. Do we, do we adjust our tactics now? There's also other priorities for that aircraft uh, across the state. And we do have to balance those priorities uh, based on their capabilities. And when we kind of rolled into this longer term management of, of fire suppression and the tactics that we chose, that actually lessened the need and the requirement for the aviation assets. And it actually lessens the risk for the uh, aviation pilots as well. And I'd like to add to that just a minute. So there's a right time and a right place to use those aircraft. Um, and in this particular case, with the way the line was installed, the location of the line, um, and where we knew this fire was probably going to end up, if I don't, we don't want to misuse aircraft either and make drops in an area that really is not going to be effective for us. Uh, where, where the location of this fire was and when the lines that were installed, um, we actually had a situation to use aircraft uh, when we needed it and when it was effective, but as far as uh, dropping the aircraft drops up on the top of the ridge where there's no real uh, reason to suppress the fire at that point, and it's going to make its way down the perimeter lines is, is really just a waste of that asset. So we got to use it in the, in, in the effective place. You know, more aircraft, you would have seen more aircraft flying. You would have probably seen our single engine air tankers. You would have seen more helicopters in the air making a tremendous at high values. Uh, if it was running into private property, if it was running on towards houses, then we would have made it much, uh, probably you would see more aircraft utilized. Um, we did use uh, the scout plane on a daily basis. It gives us a chance to cease the aerial reconnaissance. And so um, that, that aircraft has been in use almost daily. Yeah, next question has to do with can you describe the level of local support you've gotten here on this, on both fires uh, in terms of volunteer fire departments or supporting with ground operations and, and water op watering operations? Okay, so obviously we've had a heck of a partnership with that. Um, you know, early on, uh, well, there's two different fires here to talk about, but uh, when you're talking about the Grindstone Mountain Fire, I know early on there was just some initial attack support from the local local fire department units. Um, as that fire continued to progress and stay on start on, on state parks boundaries, which is in the North Carolina Forest Service jurisdiction for protection, um, obviously we still had support from them. Uh, we were having uh, water deliveries to us uh, to help us uh, with our, our, our pumping operations. And if we needed to fill engines, so we had drop points set up for those folks to drop water off for us to be able to utilize. Um, we also have to be cognizant of the fact of those folks still have a job to protect and not get uh, tied up on our incident if there's really not a necessary need and we have the capability and we have the resources to do so. So um, they were there. They were there for support anytime we needed them. Uh, the fire chiefs have been great to work with. 
uh, all the fire department members have been very willing to come and assist. But, um, you know, once it, once it pretty much stayed within the park boundary and we knew where the location of the fire lines were going to be and the tactics we were going to use, there was limited fire department personnel that were utilized at that time. Um, I'll let Derek address if there's anything else, but the support and, and just them being there for anything we needed was, has been absolutely astonishing. Yeah, we actually had a really good meeting this morning with our uh, several of our fire department representatives, fire chiefs, uh, emergency management, even our sheriff's office. And uh, we got a lot of good information from those guys as far as um, you as a community, your concerns, uh, your questions. And um, that really helped us kind of streamline our operation here and uh, uh, basically tailor what we're doing to uh, to meet the needs of the community. Understandably, there's a lot of interest in how this fire started. What can the Red Incident Management Team say to the origins of the fire at this time? Well, the fire is still under investigation, um, and that will continue. And uh, when the information is prudent and when we have the, net, the all the information is correct, then there'll probably be a release of that information. But uh, right now, the, 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 the investigation is still ongoing. Uh, we do not have a definite determined cause or origin of the fire, but we do have agents on the scene from North Carolina Forest Service that are actively working that. They've been working it for several days. And when that when that information is correct and the right time to release that information is there, we'll make sure we, you know, we put that out as necessary. Yeah, some of our guests tonight uh, remember some prescribed burning that had happened around uh, the park in the years past. Can you talk about some of the positive effects of that when it comes to fire control? Yeah, and I'd actually don't mind having a guest come up because a very good representative uh, on that situation. So um, very active in the burning program, has a lot of experience in burning. So I'm going to welcome him up and it's Thomas Crate uh, with the North Carolina State Park. So Thomas, I'm going to direct this one over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, as far as the prescribed fire impacts uh, on the park, uh, so this is an area we've had previous prescribed fire in, and uh, just recently in the last couple months, we met with the North Carolina Forest Service on our plans to burn the property. Uh, so when we got the call that there was wildfire on the property, we already had boundary lines and kind of a, a layout how we would manage this fire. So <clears throat> when the fire occurred, uh, we, we pretty much had a pre-plan in place for the fire, and so we were able to uh, take that plan that we had previously established months ago and apply it in uh, the management of this fire. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Jason? Well, there's several guests tonight that wanted to know about when the park facilities might reopen in the next near, in the near good, future. Good, good, in, good one for Thomas. Yeah, that's definitely uh, the probably the, the question on everyone's mind right now. Uh, so right now we're going to be in close consultation with the incident management team. Uh, what we need to do is we need to evaluate all the, the park infrastructure and uh, and start making our way down the trails. Uh, we have several dead trees that are burning and uh, we're going to have to make sure that they're, they're clear before we open up the park so that we can get vehicles and uh, hikers through there. And, and folks, I will say, I, after my visit to the fire today, there are a lot of snags, uh, a lot of trees that are dead or, or, or have, are weakened out there. And so we don't want to really open up the park until, you know, we make sure that at least those main travel corridors are safe. And so we'll have crews in there doing some snagging uh, along the fire lines, but also on the main road uh, and, and around the infrastructure of the park. So um, I wouldn't say it's going to happen immediately. Please bear with us as we try to wrap things up and make it a safer place for y'all to visit. My last question uh, for the evening is, can you guys better define what containment means? You've mentioned it several times tonight. Okay, so um, today, uh, you know, there was some information that I approved and put out to public information officer here on the on the team. Uh, the fire being about 1,050 acres with 20% containment. And, and I can understand questions about that when uh, about we have perimeter lines all around the fire uh and, and it's come down to our dozer line in almost all of the perimeter um so there's a little bit of a difference between uh containment and controlled but uh when, when it comes to containment um there are certain sections of the fire that we feel really comfortable with that there's very little suppression action needs to take place to make sure that we keep that fire in 
Check. That there's that, that that fire will not escape at that particular uh, particular percentage point. Um, you know, today at 20 percent, we felt like that 20 percent of the perimeter of this fire we had in good enough shape to call it actually contained. Um, and which means it requires very little suppression effort and it can actually be left on its own and we don't have to worry about fire escape. Um, so that will continue to rise over the next few days as we continue with our suppression efforts. Um, I'll let Derek also add anything he may want to add to this, his crews are, we'll, we'll see that rise on, on, on a daily basis. Um, but we don't want to necessarily call the fire contained until we make sure that we have it safe, that it doesn't require any other suppression action. Uh, that there's very little chance for escape and we have the adequate lines and adequate mop up of the hot spots and then and start to put that percentage in contain okay okay thank you uh, i think we have one little clarification here i'm going to turn it over to deputy instant commander shane hardy for one clarification there i think somebody might have had a popped in with another question Okay, so to clarify one thing, the question was asked and answered about the use of the seats on the fire. And so when Derek was talking about our operations chief, Derek Moore was referring to the, the use of seats. He was referring to the Sourtown fire. They were used there for two days uh, on the, the 9th and 10th, if I recall correctly. And, but we did not use the seats on grindstone. And as Incident Commander Greg Smith spoke, you know, the right resource, the right tool for the job, looking at the overall objective of what we were trying to accomplish. Um, that was not the right, util right tool for the job on that fire. So we did use them on one fire. We did not on the other, trying to put the right tool to use. Uh, there was also uh, another clarifying uh, question, I believe. Okay, and so the uh, sour town, the question was asked about the cause of the fire. And uh, as Greg Smith said, we're, we're not ready to release anything yet on Grindstone, but Sour Town Mountain was a, determined to be a campfire and we are okay to release that information. And, and that will conclude uh, the questions that we're gonna be able to take for tonight. And so, uh, we will end our meeting now. The video will be up on our YouTube channel at a later time. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over. Any closing comments? No, just wanted to thank everyone for your attendance, support, and questions tonight. Also wanted to thank uh, Surrey County Management uh, Emergency Management Office for hosting this event tonight at their, uh, at their headquarters. Should we hold future community meetings, the incident management team will provide that information on our social media outlets and, and other media releases. Here again, this slide uh, is showing our YouTube uh, channel for the North Carolina Forest Service, as well as the general email account if you have other inquiries uh, in the future. Thank you for your attendance tonight and be well.